myself. Okay, so I'm an institute scientist at Southwest Research Institute. Right? You have five blocks, we'll get you a cup of coffee anywhere in the world. Um, as as uh, Mihai said, I'm actually a numericist, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that in a second. You like that? We make up new words. It's great. And um, studying the dynamical evolution of the solar system, which is what I'm going to talk to you about today. Um, it was interesting hearing what Dan said about his history. Uh, when I was 12, year old, 12 years old, I got a telescope. And from that moment on, I knew exactly what I wanted to do. I chose college, graduate school, in order to be able to do this. And luckily, I've been um, a moderate success, let's say, uh, making a living doing something that is hard to make a living at. When I got into the field, I was told the unemployment rate in the field was roughly 80%. Right? So those of us that do this for a living should feel honored. Uh, I think it's very important as part of our job to communicate to the people who are actually paying us to do this about the exciting new things that we're talking about. So as I was listening to you guys, I realized, you know, the, it's a little ironic, right? This is a, a conference about communicating, and I really don't know how to communicate to you guys because you're really all over the map. There are people uh, in this room that are smarter than I am and know more about planetary science than I do, like Kelly. And uh, all the way down to somebody who said that they were um, a comic. So <laughs> this is going to make it interesting to try to communicate some of the ideas um, that I put together. So I'm going to talk to you about some recent advances we've had, let's say, over the last decade in our understanding of how the solar system formed, how the planets were put together, and how they evolved over time. Uh, this is actually taken from sort of a canned public talk I have. Uh, sort of beefed up the science a little bit. Uh, maybe that was a mistake. We'll have to see how much you think at the end. Um, and when, whenever you go in and give a talk, particularly to the public, the important thing to do is get them on board right away by, by supplying them with a hook of something they can understand, something in the news that they can grab onto before you launch into these esoteric ideas. What I typically do is talk about uh, Pluto and whether Pluto is a planet Everybody is aware of that controversy. Um, initially, I was planning to take that out, but since I learned that Alan was going to be talking about this uh, tomorrow, and we had very, 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 very different views on this, <laughs> I decided to, to leave this stuff in, in at the beginning of my talk. Um, as you can see here, I put uh, the, the eight planets of the solar system up uh, to start, and you know, Pluto's not there. And after all, wants to be, he's trying to get into this call by self <laughs> um, behavior, but no, that's it's, just, it, it's in the club, you'll catch up. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but uh, as you'll see, my opinion is that it should not be included in this club. So I'm going to just sort of start off and explain a little bit about what I do, right? Since this is such a diverse group, I consider myself what I call a numericist or a numerical experimentalist. I don't go to the telescope uh, very often. Uh, and so I thought I'd start off talking about why we need numerical experiments in astronomy. And, and let's take an analogy of a biologist trying to understand the life cycle of a monarch but butterfly. They can put the butterflies in the cage, watch them breed, lay eggs, hatch, and grow, and follow their life cycles. We can't do that in astronomy, right? The time scales are just too bloody long for us to be able to see what's going on. So, uh, for example, the Earth took 60 million years to form, and there are solar systems where the Earth is forming, but I don't feel like we should wait for that process to complete before we understand what's going on. So what we do is we run, essentially, experiments on the computer. We build software uh, that we hope has all the important physics of the planet formation process in it. In my case, it's mostly dynamics, orbits, and how things move around and hit one another. Um, we sort of invent initial conditions of what we think uh, uh, the initial solar system look like, run it through our code, get results, compare it to what we see, and depending on whether we match what we see or not, we go back and do the process over and over and over again. So that's basically what I do. So getting on to the Pluto, you know, if we look at the solar system, in 1992, this is basically what we thought the planetary system looked like. 
there are the terrestrial planets, the two gas giants, the two ice giants, and then there's this weird, lonely thing sitting out at the edge of the solar system, essentially by itself. Okay, here's another way of looking at that, looking at the planetary orbits, where the terrestrial planets are down here, and here are the four giant planets, and there's Pluto. And for a long time, since the 1930s, this is what we thought the planetary system looked like. But in 1992, we found the first of what we recognized of the transit of the Tudian objects. It was actually the second transit of the Tudian object. Now. Pluto was the first. But it was small compared to Pluto, just about 10%. So we no one really got worried, but we started thinking about it. And as equipment got better, we found more and more of them, right? As we searched more and more of the sky, right, the, ob the largest object in that population started getting bigger and bigger. People started wondering whether we would find something comparable or bigger than Pluto as this search goes on. And as you all know, in 2002, there it goes, we found, or 2005, we found what at the time was thought to be the first object bigger than Pluto. Mike Brown did this, and his collaborators at Caltech. Essentially what they do is they take the telescope, point it at an area of the sky, they take an image, come back a little while later, take another image, come back a little while and take a third image and then blink them and look for something that moves. Can you all see it? Can you see it? Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Right? And believe it or not, that's the best image we have. Right? It's very far away. Initially, we thought this object was bigger than Pluto, but now it looks like it's actually slightly smaller than Pluto. But that started this debate raging as to whether uh, Pluto, this object should be considered a planet and whether Pluto should be considered a planet. It's interesting what actually brought it to the head was the idea of how we name this object, because planets are named differently than Kuiper Belt objects are named. So the IAU had to decide whether this was a planet or not before it could be named. So let's ask the question, what is the planet? There are many possible definitions. Some include Pluto, while others do not. I think if you look at this, we can all agree at the end members, right? that this, which is Mercury, right, is a planet, while this thing probably shouldn't be considered a planet. But the debate, I think the debate has a very, to me, the answer is not as interesting as the sociological uh, implications of this debate, which has been going on, as you know, for a long time. And I think what's happening here is that people that do planetary science actually have two very different ways of looking at the systems that they're studying. And again, I'm going to use biology as an analogy. There are people who study forests, right, who walk into a forest and they see this wonderful system with trees, animals, right, um, other plants, and, and try to figure out how these things interact with each other and how the system as a whole works. There's also a group of people who are more interested in the trees themselves. And they go in and they see an oak, or they see a pine, and they try to understand how the individual trees grow and evolve. And I think this debate really hinges on this difference. There are those of us who are interested in the planetary system as a whole. We look at the whole thing as a population, are interested in how they interact with one another. And then there are people who actually go out and study the individual objects, who are more interested in how the geology of Pluto works, by the geology of Mars, the atmospheres. And they tend to come down on very different ends of the scale whether you consider Pluto to be a planet. I tend to sit in the first group, right? And so I, I know this isn't a very pretty picture, particularly for the photographers in the room, but this is how I think of the solar system, right? This is a plot, it's a little old now and out of date, but this is a plot of the size of an object as a function of its semi-major axis or average distance from the sun. And it's a lot of scale. I'm just going to get that. Okay. Right, so this is an object that's 100 kilometers, a little asteroid, right? And all the planets are up near 10,000 kilometers in size. And when I look at this, I say, the answer to what is the planet and what is not is obvious, right? You sit here and you say, there are these eight gods that are sitting in this population by themselves, right? They're special, right? We should somehow call them out to the public 
as these are the guys that are important. Pluto and Eris, which are these two guys, are really part of a population of objects, part of a continuous size distribution, as you like to say. Right? And they don't stand apart. And so to me, this is how we should answer this question. Right? That looking at this, there are eight important objects and a lot of, I don't want to call them drakes, but a lot of smaller things. But the other people look at it from quite differently, right? They're more interested in how individual objects work. So, you know, here are some things. They look at the geology of Mars, for example, and they want to understand how that individual body behaves and grows. They tend to fall on the side of calling just about anything that's big and round, right, a planet. And they say, you know, we should base planethood on the physical characteristics of these objects, right? I'm a man, I should be a man whether I'm standing here or I'm standing in my home, right? Or no matter what I'm doing, I'm a man and I should be a man. That's the view, all right? Another way of putting it is uh, what I like to call the Star Trek test, where right? Captain Kirk and Spock fly around a planet, go in orbit, they look down and they say, ah, that's a planet or it's not, right? So, and I think that's a valid viewpoint, actually. And it's, it's something we should consider. But I want to point out that if we decide to come up with a definition of planethood that follows that kind of thing, it actually flies in the face of the historical use of the word. If you go back and look through time, history, why did that work? And look at some, for example, what's in dictionaries or in old astronomy texts, right? Planets are the finest objects that move around the sun right, are in orbit. So planetude is defined by how objects behave relative to other objects around it and not by the physical characteristics, right? I'm a man, and I'm a man no matter where I am, but I'm also a father, and I'm also an astronomer, right? So there could be a debate on what kind of word planet is. Is it as a intrinsic characteristic? I'm a man. Or it's how I interact with the world around me? I'm an astronomer or a father. Right? I tend to think it's the latter, while the people that define want to keep Pluto as a planet seem to think it's the former. Now, I have to point out that we could, as a society or as an astronomical community, decide to go with the, you know, on the man definition. But it is really a radical shift in the past, from the past. The IAU definition, which is based on dynamics, is actually, I think, more in tune with historically how the word has been used. And it's also re less radical because we go from having nine planets, which had to include Eris, to eight, instead, as I will show you in a second, going from nine to a thousand, which is what you need if you uh, accept the definition is uh, based on uh, whether an object is you know, hyperstatic equilibrium. So the people who want to base it on that inherent characteristic, I guess the strongest argument or the strongest definition they have is they want the object to be round, right? It's in hydrostatic equilibrium, which means that deep down in the inside of the planet, the gravity overcomes the physical strength of the rocks and things crack, right? And therefore it flows and it basically these things are round. But the problem with that is if you look at this, here are a bunch of things that are round. Here's our objects and the real objects in the solar system. Can anybody tell me based on just the pictures, which of these are planets and which of them are not? Yeah? Mars is a planet, the others are moons. Uh, well, Mercury is in there, right? They're all, they're all planets. Well, <laughs> it's, easy, it's easy to tell. How's that? They're not all planets by the classical definition. I don't care if people thought in the 20th century. <laughs> <laughs> Fine, so. So your position, therefore, is that even the satellites are planets. Of course they are. <laughs> and your colleagues routinely call them planets in their technical talks. They talk about Titan, Ganymede, Europa, the moon as planets. No, I've never heard that. Never heard there is a world, but not planets. 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 There is a book on my bookshelf <laughs> called Earth-like planets, which includes the moon. 
written by some of the founders of our, our field. Okay. I'll send you the I'll send you okay. the reference. Yeah. Listen closely, you'll hear it all the time. But from the point of view of what you learned when you were in graduate with elementary school, right? Would you feel comfortable with a change that takes you from you know Gatomy and Callisto being salaries to one where it's put on the list of planets? So that's the kind of question you're asking yourself when you talk about this definition. So uh, I should point out, uh, right, I tend to like to use the world, word worlds when you talk about these macroscopic things that are around and use the dynamical definition for planet when it comes to defining where they are in the hierarchy of astronomical objects. So having said that, there are actually three, I think, significant problems with using the, the definition of hydrostatic equilibrium to define planet. Okay, first is essentially asking the question, how round is round? Right? If you look at the Kuiper Belt, we know we have objects that look like this. This is uh, surface map of Pluto. Right? It's got a radius of 1,200 kilometers thereabout. And objects that look like this. This is Comet Borelli. Okay? This is an uh, object that originated in the Kuiper Belt. Right? It's a, now a Jupiter family comet, but originally it was in the Kuiper Belt. And not only do you have these two extremes, but you have every size in between. There's roughly 10 billion objects in the cover belt larger than a kilometer, and they fit into a nice, smooth size distribution. You have Uranus and Pluto, and Maki Maki's a little smaller, and the hollow man. By the way, you see this shape? Right? It's shaped like a football. That's actually real. This object's really shaped like that, and it's in a hydrostatic equilibrium. It's got that shape because it's spinning real fast. Right? It's a remarkable object. Going down to Sedna, Orcus and you keep going down and down, right? And so if you want to draw an arbitrary line between what's a planet and what's not, based on this roundness definition, someplace you have to draw this line. And wherever you draw it, based on the smooth distribution, there's going to be an object that's slightly above it, that's going to be a planet, and one that looks almost identically like it, that's slightly below the line, that won't be a planet. So this idea, of the Star Trek test that Kirk and Spock go in the orbit around Maki Maki, right? They look down and they say, huh, that's a planet. Cannot work. We already know that there are objects in the solar system for which one will be a planet and one won't by this definition that look almost exactly the same. Excuse me, Bob. Yes. What is the smallest, pretty spherical? the smallest that we know of this, you could call a sphere. I don't think, I'm mean, using roundness as a euphemism for being in hydrostatic equilibrium. There are actually a few NEAs which are spherical, but they're just spherical because they happen to come together that way, right? It isn't the physics that's demanding that for them to be spherical. So you have to be a little careful with the roundness definition, okay? I really mean hydrostatic equilibrium. Yes? So, and, and also the question too about, is about Vesta, right? Is Vesta considered to be hydrostatic equilibrium now based on the latest Dawn results? Uh, I don't, no, it's not. The basins okay. have these big, you know, holes. Okay. Okay. But it's differential. But series might be. Okay. And differentiated is not saying right. hydrostatic equilibrium, actually. They mean slightly different things. Yeah. Well, I'm going to use Venus as a. I mean, it depends. Yeah, it depends, depends on the history, yeah, right? Actually, it's actually about a couple hundred kilometers, and I'll show that. Yeah. With the but, diagram produced by Lovis. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me? <laughs> With the diagram produced by Lovis. Oh, I was, I was. For a long time in this debate, I tried to stay in the center, right? And be sort of the middle child, as Alan kept calling me but I've gotten more radicalized for reasons I won't go into uh, since the debate in Prague in 2006. So uh, the other problem with this is that if you actually look at the Kuiper Belt, 
there's going to be something like a thousand planets in the solar system if you were to find this definition, which seems a little awkward to me. Let me show you how we actually come up with that answer. Here is a plot showing, uh, these are real observations of the Kuiper Belt, showing the number of objects per square degree. So these guys go out, point the telescope, find these guys, right, and count up the number of guy, objects that they find and divide by the, the area of the sky that they search and give you this density, surface density of objects as a function of their visual magnitude, how faint they are. If we want to use Venus, which is the thing that I'm going to use, which looks pretty round to me, satellite of Saturn, as the canonical boundary, this object would have a magnitude of 21 at 40 AU, assuming the 14% of Venus. So, if you take Mimos and look at the size distribution, again, these are real observations. So we know these objects exist. There's roughly 0.02 objects per square degree. And if you make some assumptions about the size and shape of the Kuiper Belt, you end up that this implies that there's 400 and some odd objects in the Kuiper Belt that we can see bigger than this object. And dynamical models show that we can see roughly half the tons of them. Cover belt, so that ends up giving you something like 900 objects. I'm rounding up to 1,000 objects brighter than Venus, the more size of Venus. So you'll end up with something that looks like this, where these objects are all the planets, and these objects, and notice it's taking this distribution of the Kuiper belt and dividing it in half, being uh, planets above this line. That seems really awkward to me. Again, this makes much more sense if you look at this plot to me. The other thing I think is a lot of, there's so much emotion around this. It has to do with the people that actually are working on this. They feel somehow that these objects aren't included in the list of planets. You're somehow demoting, right? So, you know, these guys are the lucky guys, and these guys are somehow less lucky, right? Okay? But that's not really true. You know, I'm, you know I keep making this point that to me, these guys are the planets. But scientifically, it's the little guys that are the most interesting. These are the guys that are going to tell us how the solar system evolved and changed over time. Okay, I've made a living of turning out plots like this into dynamical evolution models for the solar system. Those are the guys that are most interesting. So the fact that you're a planet or not really doesn't change whether you're interested. Okay, so uh, the third problem is not only will be a thousand planets, but we're not really going to know which are planets or which are not. Because I showed you those data of years, right? That thing is faint. It's 21 by magnitudes. Um, it's very hard to observe. That's about the best image we have. We have some spectra of it, but no more. Okay, so these things, besides the means, are going to be really, really hard to observe. So we're not going to be able to tell whether they're in hydrostatic heat. Now, you can maybe make some estimates by making assumptions about albedo of these objects and their densities and what they're made of to try to estimate whether they're planets or not. But our understanding of the Kuiper Belt shows that you're unlikely to be a success at that. Here's a plot, for example, showing albedo as a function of inclination in the Kuiper Belt, right? And the fact that there's a trend here, which I must admit I do not understand, neither <laughs> does anybody else. The thing I want you to take away from this is there are objects in the Kuiper Belt with an albedo of 2% and objects in the Kuiper Belt with an albedo of 50%, right? So there's, there's no way you're going to be able to look at an object and say, ah, I have a brightness based on reflected light and from that being able to estimate the size because the albedos are all over the place. The same is true with the density. In order to do hydrostatic equilibrium, you need a size and a mass. Okay, so typically what you would want to do is turn a radius into a density, right? Or a radius into a mass, assuming a density. And again, if you look at the Kuiper Belt, these are real data. You have objects in the Kuiper Belt that have a density of less than 0.5, and objects in the Kuiper Belt car is off the list here with a density of almost 2. So there's no way, once we discover an object, right, we're going to be able to determine whether this object is a planet. So we're going to be faced with a situation if you adopt this idea of using hydrostatic equilibrium as a, planet, a discriminator for planets, that you're going to have 10, 15, 20 objects we know are planets, 1,000 objects which we have no clue whether they're planets. 
Okay, and that's not, in my, in my opinion, a very satisfactory situation. Yes? I was just wondering, how do you determine whether it's a new hydrostatic equilibrium? It's a theoretical calculation, which is the one. Well, oh, how do you determine whether it's a new hydrostatic equilibrium or not? Right, observationally, it's hard. I think, at least as a, a year or two ago, and somebody may be able to correct me, Kelly, you probably know this, there's still a debate whether Rhea, which is a satellite of Saturn, is in hydrostatic equilibrium, and we've been observing it with Cassini for years. So the detail of whether something is in hydrostatic equilibrium or not is very hard. Okay? But in this case, you can write a sort of an analytical expression. That's what Alan was talking about. He and I did that a few years ago and made a plot, okay, where you can sort of say, uh, here arbitrarily is the value. But even for the, but even if that's true and you want to adopt that. Right, the fact that we can never know really the, the radii and, and masses of these objects means we won't even be able to apply that equation. Yeah, I mean, a really good case in point is Vesta, which, which we've now seen in very close detail. <clears throat> and it's got, you know, hills and valleys and uh, big crater rims and stuff. And if it were in hydrostatic equilibrium, over time, all that should go away. Right. right, at some level, I mean, the small scale stuff. And so it's really, there's, there's, it's a line, you have to decide where the line in the sand is that you're going to draw in terms of the topography of an object before you can say it's an hydrostatic equilibrium. Well, can't the density vary uh, uh, in an object? Yeah, but really for this, we care about what we call the bulk or average density. Yeah. And even if you go back, I mean, these numbers that I was giving for the density in this plot, right, are bulk average densities. And they literally are all over the map. It tells you, I mean, we don't even know how to start to interpret this for the hyperbola. You find objects, right, that are essentially sitting in the same location in space, and yet there's this huge diversity in the density. You can sort of explain part of it, but I think this is a big mystery that we need to be working on. Right? That was very surprising. I'm a theorist, I hate data. <laughs> <laughs> it, just, it just confuses everything. <laughs> First of all, I hope yes. somebody tweeted that. <laughs> <laughs> well, second, I mean, it, given that, I may not even need to give my thought. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, you know, sometimes better to ignore data than to use it poorly. <laughs> we'll see about that. <laughs> Well, a great man once said this. Is this a bullet thing? Is that what it is? You want to, you want to try that? He's a tall human. Alan is a not so tall human. I won't go, I won't go there. Making an analogy with Pluto. No way. Uh, um, so like I said earlier, I prefer when you talk about these macroscopic objects to use the word world when you're just thinking about the physical object. So the official, the IAU definition, has the solar system divided in this way. We have what, I, what they call classical, what they're now called major planets, the terrestrial planets, which mostly not rock, right? the gas giants, which are mostly hydrogen and helium, and the ice giants, which are essentially have the same composition as comets. Right? They actually, you know, when I was growing up, we were told terrestrial planets are giant comets, right? But Uranus and Neptune are really totally different in just about every way in Jupiter's time. Right? So you really need to divide this in three major groups, okay? Um, and then you have the dwarf planets, which are too small to have important dynamical effects. So I, I must admit, I agree with Alan on the fact that the IAU definition, the way they wrote it, I understand what they did, is, is so crazy, okay? But I think, you know, if you get beyond what they actually wrote, and look at the intent, I think that's a valid way of looking at the problem. So you have a system that sort of looks like this. This is a plot, again, orbital eccentricity, which is how out of round the orbit is, okay, as a function of the average distance from the sun and the size of the object. It goes, I think, the log of the mass. If I remember how I did this, I don't remember right now, it's a little plot. And oh, here I'm only plotting those objects that are dynamically stable for long periods of time. Right? And you can see you have the inner region, which is totally cleared out. 
dominated by the terrestrial planets. You have the giant planets, which clear out this region, except for the place where what we call mean motion resonances. That's where the, uh, the dynamics of the planet is actually driving the dynamics of the small guy and stabilizing the world. So even though you have this population of Trojans, asteroids here, which lead and follow Jupiter at 60 degrees from its orbit, Jupiter is dy dynamically dominating the behavior of these things, even though they exist. Right here's another place where mean motion resonance with Jupiter is the dominant player in the behavior of these things. And so Jupiter is dominating all this, then it's clear, and then you have this mess that's the Kuiper Belt, that's Pluto, and that's Eros. Okay? Notice they're not in nearly circular and nice behaved orbits, and they're part of this match of other things. They're embedded in this population of other objects. Excuse me? I will. Okay, but I'm a little bit in a minute. Okay, so now I've been talking for what? Half an hour? Something like that. Now I'm going to actually start talking about what I wanted to talk about from a scientific point of view, which is how our view of planet formation has changed in the last few years. Okay, so I'm going to take you through sort of class of planet formation 101. Of course, how everything, all these planets form and stars, is you have these big molecular clouds that become dynamically unstable. Okay, these things are spinning very slowly because of the gravitational tugs that they are feeling by their neighbors. And just like as a dancer pulls in their arms, they spin up in order to conserve angular momentum, right? These clouds start to spin as faster and faster as they collapse. And they're faced with this problem. And the problem is if you can't get all the material in that gas disk into the central star because there's too much angular momentum. And so what the, the, the system does is that as it's collapsing, most of the mass goes in here, but it generates a disk of material that has most of the angular momentum. This disk is made of gas mainly and has small particles, about the size of particles in cigarette smoke, right? That's the solids. And somehow you go from those tiny little particles the size of dust to this, right? To us. And that's the process that we're interested in studying. So you get this disk. The first thing that happens is the dust starts to settle out and form a very narrow plane of small particles in the plane of this disk. And then they start to grow. So, uh, you know, since I'm trying to tell you what's new, this is the first step that I think that's really changed significantly in the last five years. If I gave this talk five years ago, I would say the first step of making planets is, and then a miracle occurs, right? <laughs> Somehow we have these little tiny grains of things and turn them into macroscopic, what we call planetesimals. And how that happened was a complete mystery, right? You can imagine starting off with these dust grains and they would float around and they would stick, right? If you look under my bed, you see these dust bunnies that are made up of this accumulation of these small guys. So I think we understood how we get from the dust to something the size of this, right? The problem was how do you get from this to something the size of a mountain? Because if I take this and this, you know, what's holding together those dust bunnies is those electrostatic forces, right? If I take this and this and put them together, they're not going to stick because of hydrostatic forces. Right, so you can't get these things to grow by pair waves, by secretion, until you get to the point where gravity becomes important in the state. So we had what we call the meter barrier. We couldn't figure out how to get past this meter barrier. And I think actually this problem has been solved in the last few years in a very clever way. So remember I said earlier, you have the situation, you have this gas disk, the dust is settling out, Right, forming this narrow disk of, of particles. And what happens is this thing collapses. You generate turb turbulence at the boundary between the particle layer and the gas layer. That turbulence starts to 
what you see here are particles embedded in a turbulent disk. You don't see the gas. But what happens is these particles start concentrating in these, in these clumps. And these clumps can get very dense and collapse to make the first macroscopic objects. This is a cool new result that's about five years old. The interesting implication from a planet point of view is that these clumps are really big. They're about 100 kilometers in size. So if these models are right, you went from something the size of this to something 100 kilometers in size in one small swoop, swoop, right? It just went thump, and it was done. Uh, well, there's actually two groups that are looking at different aspects of this. Jeff Cousy is one of them. And a uh, guy by the name of John Hansen is another. Andy Yoden is part of that team. He's an American you can talk to if you want. It's really, really cool stuff. What, uh, what is keeping them together so that they can grow so large? It's like just, it's it depends like on the model, actually. The what's, so what's happening is what's you have these, right? What's happening, let's talk about, um, uh, let's talk about Cousy's model. Uh, because I think it's interesting, or easier to understand. Although this is actually Johansson's model uh, simulation. So what's happening is you've got these turbulence, right, which are big, like eddies, and these things are moving around in the eddies. And um, if you have an object that's, let's say, a millimeter in size, as it's going around the eddy, it feels a centrifugal force and starts moving out of the center of the eddy. And start, so they start concentrating at the corners. Right? And you get, you get to the point where these densities are so high that their gravity dominates over the gases attempt to strip them apart. And then it'll just collapse and become a solid object. So they're pulling around the outside of the eggs. In, that, in Cousy's model, it turns out in Johansson's model they concentrated the scent, but it's just essentially a different part of the, to me, it's similar process. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes. Trying to understand the okay, so you've got these eddies, but what a lot of times eddies require some kind of boundary to hold them in. Is there what, what physical mechanism confines them, keeps them from blasting? Well, pressure from the rest of the gas. Oh, okay, okay. So right. it's, I mean, it's so within you know, the streams of right thunderstorm activity, which you'll hopefully okay. see this afternoon, are <laughs> eddies, right, right in in the atmosphere, right, and that's a similar type of thing. Okay, thank you. Could you I'm just looking for a nice, uh, simple example to explain it to somebody. Uh, I'll sometimes see, you know, during high water, the river comes down, you'll get these eddies of foam that form mm -hmm. between the bottoms of these large rock formations, mm -hmm. and they swirl. Is it something similar to that? Yeah, that I think that's what, I mean, I think that's more like a vortex, but people are trying to use vortex to do the same, vortices to do the same thing. I mean, this, I'm talking about sort of a class of models, or several, but, but if you look at that, Spinning foam, the foam sort of concentrates in the center, right? But it also around the edge, too. Yeah, it does both, depending on the size, right? And that's why these models are different. That's good. That's okay? You ready? Oh, ready? I, I just wanted to offer something that perhaps easiest. Imagine if you take a drum <coughs> and you put it and put fine sand. There are places where the dust will collect, places where it will run away. The places that have minimal motion up and down, that's where the dust will. We'll, we'll come together. From there, we'll 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 so. yep. In this case, yeah. That's how you get these big things right away. Sorry, I slipped through it. No, okay. It's fighting these colds. It's so hot here. So, um, got this nasty stone cold. So, this is a new part of this problem. So, the, the interesting aspect of this, by the way, we heard this talk about Osiris Rex. If this model is right, the first things to be born in uh, the solar system are 100 kilometers. The objects that we see as NEAs and as comets are not primordial objects. They're actually fragments of collisions of these first primordial objects. So you have to be a little careful about over-interpreting that as well. Okay. Then what happens is sort of the standard picture. Once you have these big guys Forming, right, they rattle around, they hit one another, they stick, sometimes they break, depending on how fast they're moving, right? And this is a simulation of this, it's actually a brand new code, this is the first code that could actually, to do this that we've been writing, starting off with a population of planetesimals and correctly following dynamics and collisional evolution, you follow them up, 
And you can see in a very short period of time, only 100,000 years or a few hundred thousand years, you can build objects, the massive Mars, out of 1AU just by these two body collisions. Yeah, it's about 100,000 years. Then what happens depends on where you are, okay, and the time scales for this. In the inner solar system, let me go back a second. You have this population of moon and Mars-sized things. They go gravitationally unstable. They go completely all over the place, uh, scattering each other, hitting each other, and you have this final stage of what we call giant impacts that lead to the formation of the terrestrial planets, the ice giants probably, and the cores of the giant planet. The moon probably formed during this time as, uh, as a result of an impact between the proto-Earth uh, and an object about the mass of Mars. In the inner solar system, this process lasted about 100, 100 million years or so. So the whole thing is set up in less than a million years. And then the final cleanup takes much longer, right? A factor of 100 longer per century. If you're in a region of the solar system, which probably happened, must have happened, I should say, for Jupiter and Saturn, where these glowing bodies get roughly 10 times the mass of the Earth before this gas dis dissipates, right? What happens is the planets can suck gas directly out of the nebula and grow just by the direct accretion of this nebula gas pointing the gas giants, right? This has been a region, I mean, we've known, understood this for a very long time, but there's been a sort of controversy around it uh, and what happens. Because what people have found is that planets can move around a lot during this phase. And essentially what happens is this. So this is going to be an animation of putting a planet in a gas disk the color of the gas disk represents density, okay? So here's the sun, here's the planet. And what happens when you put the planet in, if it's big enough, it opens up a gap, okay, in the gas disk. And that locks it into the disk, right? Now the disk is trying to evolve by itself. And essentially what it wants to do is drain onto the central star. That's how the gas disk goes away. And this planet is stuck there. As a result, the planet is dragged in with the disk closer and closer and closer to the sun. Right? This theory had been around for a long time. Right? No one quite believed in it because, after all, Jupiter is still a 5 AU, far from the sun. But when the discovery of these extrasolar hot Jupiters happened, the theorists actually were prepared. Right? You know, you hear, you read the media, you guys. Right? You read when 51 Peg was discovered in 1995. They said, this copter is totally by surprise. It turns out that's not true. Okay, we actually expected this, and theorists were spending a lot of time trying to understand why it didn't happen, right? And as soon as we saw these planets, we said, aha, they don't have to do that. But then the question became, why didn't that happen here? Why, why is Jupiter still at 5 AU? So, and I think now, this is another new advancement in, the, in this field in the last few years, we have an answer to that. Okay, and it turns out that migration of Jupiter can stop by Saturn. And what happens is that Saturn can form, migrate too, but it migrates faster than Jupiter, and then hits what is called the two to three mean motion resonance. I told you. Uh, with Jupiter. Okay, so here's Jupiter and it's migrating in, and here's Saturn and it begins to migrate in until it hits to this magical point that we call the two to three mean motion resonance. This is the point where Saturn is going around the Sun exactly twice for every time Jupiter is going around the Sun. Okay, and that's a very powerful position to be because they can start acting in concert. The gravitational tugs will work on the surrounding gas together rather than being to totally independent of them. And what that allows happen, remember I said that the planets are moving because you put the planet in, it opens up a, gas, a gap in the gas disk. 
and the gas is moving around, and the planet has to follow it because it's locked to the gas case. If you put Saturn in this resonance, it turns out that gas can get through the gap because of this mutual tugging of one another. And as a result, the gas can move in, and Jupiter and Saturn don't, doesn't have to. So what happens is you see they're both migrating, they hit the resonance, and then it looks like in this plot they stop. Okay? Well, it turns out they don't stop. If you look carefully, they're actually moving outward. And that has led to this, I think, great new model. I think it came out a year ago. The Grand Pack, is that when it came out? By um, uh, Kevin Walsh, who's now my postdoc, was involved in this. And the basic idea is Jupiter starts, formed basically where we see it today. Saturn was somewhere near the two to three motion, three motion resonance with Jupiter. Jupiter spiraled all the way in to 2 AU. So it was sitting at 2 AU in the asteroid belt. When Saturn got large enough to open up a gap and become important, that allowed the gas to flow by the planets, and then they turned around to migrate out to the point where we see them today. This is a really cool new idea. And I'm going to show you an animation, and I'll tell you why it's interesting from all sorts of reasons in a minute. So this represents the orbit of Jupiter. This represents the orbit of Saturn. This is a disk of planetesimals that in their model are rocky things that form close to the sun. No ice. They just do it as very just asteroids, rocks. And here's a disk of icy things, right, that formed essentially the giant planets. So what they think is Jupiter starts spiraling in, Saturn follows it in, you go until Jupiter's at around 2 AU, they hit the resonance, then bounce, and the planets move out to where we see them today. So, yes? So, can you give us a sense of how the rest of you numericists, the dynamical community, is embracing this idea? Because lots of people have ideas for how the solar system comes together. Is this sort of like the model to be at this point? For this phase? Yeah. yeah. So it would be fair to I say. I mean, I'm, I'm, I should say, although Kevin now works for me, I'm not involved in this one, right? Although, you know, uh, um, I collaborate with a lot of people that are. I'm, I'm actually dubious because of their claim. Let me just get to this in a second, okay? When I show you why they, they think this is an interesting twist to the story of migration, okay? So, are you all ready? Can I go on? Or? Just one. Sure. As Jupiter is moving into two AUs, do we know what happened to, say, Mars and Earth at that time? Any idea? Because that's getting really close to Mars. Okay, so, yeah, I should have said this. I'm sorry, and I'll, mix, I'll fix this the next time. Right? This has to happen when the gas disk is still around. Right? Because, the, because you know, the whole evolution is due to the disk. The time scale for that is actually really short. Two, three million years, if you look at that's um, just uh, other planetary systems. So the interesting problem that we're faced with in this game, okay, is that we know the moon forming that impact, the Earth planet finished growing at something like 60 million years. But by this, Jupiter and Saturn had to stop finish forming by three million years. So in this game, right, we're faced with we have to form the biggest planets in the solar system first. All right? So all this happens before the terrestrial planets are there. Okay? As a matter of fact, if you look at this end result, so here's their final system. There's a couple things you should notice, right? Is that the disks from which the terrestrial planets form here are truncated at about 1 AU. One of the problems that we're faced with in understanding planet formation is, you know, is that Mars is too small. When we sit down and run our models, we always end up with a Mars that's about the size of the Earth or maybe even bigger. So one of the things that we've been trying to understand is the small size of Mars. By truncating this disk inside the orbit of Mars, which is what they're doing, right, you can try to explain Mars as small size. So that's one, I don't believe this aspect of this particular model, but that's one um, success of this model, okay? The other thing is that the asteroid belt, which is in through here, is depleted and matured, right? The asteroid belt has about 0.01% of the amount of stuff we thought should be there, 
if you just assume that the disk from which the planets form was smooth. And one of the things we've been trying to do is understand how it became depleted. And they argue they solved this problem. Yeah. The other thing I want you Go ahead. I just have a quick question. Does this change what we think is under all the clouds on the gas giants? Is it rockier than we... No, because uh, the gas giants still basically formed out of the same material. But they came in and scooped up a lot of the rocky material. After they were gas giants. So that stuff's mixed into the atmospheres, but okay. not into the cores. So the first stages of being built mainly from icy stuff is still the same as it was. And if I can add, we have uh, measurement constraints on what's on the inside of these, these bodies. Their bulk density is one good constraint, correct? Right. right. So it's, it's actually the models that have to match the data. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, but the data is not good enough, which is why we're flying to Juno. Yeah. Right. Right. Juno will give, you the, give us the internal structure of Juno, and therefore will answer a lot of the controversies about how it forms. Right. So we're still going to be getting more data. Well, do you think you can wrap up in about five minutes? Carry on with discussion. Oh, I'm sorry, am I going too long? The other thing. We've got a lot of discussion mixed in. Okay. <laughs> sorry. I, but the other thing to notice is you have a lot of blue in here, right? So they're arguing that this process delivered material that was water rich and therefore supplied the water. So you're getting a lot out of this. Okay. Um, the last stage that's pretty new in, in our understanding of this is this whole process about how planets form. There's nothing in that process, now we realize it, that will lead you to have a stable, dynamically stable planetary system at the end of this. Now you can build these planets, but there's nothing that says that if you allow them to orbit the sun for a long period of time, that their orbits remain stable. And indeed, we believe now that we see a lot of evidence of dynamical instabilities, a late reshuffling of these orbits as the planets evolve. This had to do, if you look at the extrasolar planet community, you find a lot of Jupiter mass things on very eccentric orbits. It's probably the result of this kind of dynamical instability. We believe that such an instability uh, occurred in our own solar system. If you guys have heard of the Nice model, um, um, that's one scenario for how this happened. Uh, we believe that the giant planets formed in a very compact configuration, Jupiter, Saturn, and Neptune, and Uranus in this case, okay? All of them were within about 12 or 13 astronomical units of the sun. They were in mean motion resonance with, with, with one another, and you had this massive disk of material beyond the, the growing planets. Okay, this had objects in it like Pluto, and there were probably around 1,000 of them. Matter of fact, the model is dependent on that. Okay, so what essentially happens if you take this system and put it in our model, in our computers, and integrate the orbits, it turns out this is stable. The system could still look like this, except for a little gravitational tug between this disk and the planets that slowly leads to the planet's orbits changing with time. And eventually, after many hundreds of millions of years, this system goes unstable. Uranus and Neptune get scattered into this disk. The gravitational in interactions with this disk circularize the orbits of Uranus and Neptune, leaving the system that we see today. Now you may ask, but this is a pretty crazy idea. And it's become sort of the standard scenario, I think that's fair to say, don't you tell me, for the evolution of the solar system. Why would anybody believe this? And the answer <laughs> is, and I, and I can say that on the off, right? The answer to this is that it quantitatively explains a lot of what we see in the outer solar system. I'm just listing a few of them here. It explains the Trojan asteroids, not only their orbits, but how much is there. It explains the late heavy bombardment on the moon, right? It explains in some way the, the dynamical shape of the Kuiper belt, which is really weird. It gives you the irregular satellites, the giant planets, uh, Neptune Trojans, and there was even a paper last Year, year before uh, by Amy Barr and Robin Knopp, saying that it explains why Ganymede is differentiated and Callisto is not. Okay, and you get basically all of this for free because when we built the model, all we were trying to do is get the orbits of the giant planets right. And once we nailed that down, 
and then started looking at all these other things, we pretty much reproduced almost the entire outer solar system. And that's why this has sort of become the industry standard. So I will stop now to point out that this was funded by NASA. I am also a member of another NSLI group, the one at Southwest called Chloe. And uh, I put all my talks on the web. Right? This one in particular was written in HTML and JavaScript. Okay, some of them are in PDF, but if you want to download them, feel free to do that. Thank you.